And welcome back to the Kick Your Boots Up podcast. I'm your host, Taylor McAdams. And joining today at the Justin headquarters is none other than Tom Feller. He is actually the director of event marketing here at Justin Brands. And I'm one of the fortunate ones to get to work with him on our team. But the most prominent thing I have to talk about, just really quick, Tom, is to just showcase the importance and the honor that it is that you got recently inducted to into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs, Colorado. What an honor. Congratulations. And thank you for being on today. Thank you very much. It is quite an honor. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming. I'm not sure that it's totally sunk in just yet, but, uh, you know, it, it's not about Tom Feller, the person. It's about all the things that it, uh, I've experienced in rodeo through Justin and through rodeo as a career. Oh, without a doubt. And speaking of that a little bit, will you tell us a little bit about your rodeo background and how you got started in the industry? Well, actually, uh, we were raised in the in the city. No one in our families ever had any connection with uh, agriculture other than perhaps a garden or my mother talking about milking the cows when she was little. But uh, my brother and I just seemed to gravitate towards rodeo. And oddly enough, our maternal grandfather was quite an artist and he did a lot of wood burning and carvings and stuff. And at uh, when Jim Bob and I were just young kids in elementary school, our granddad did a wood carving that Jim Bob still has, but it depicted a rodeo scene and clowns and bulls. And to our knowledge, the man had never even been to a rodeo. So it was kind of like a premonition of, of the future for both of us. And what an incredible future it became because you went on to be a funny barrel man. Talk to us about your time there. What was that like, entertaining the crowd and being the funny man? Well, I think, you know, a funny barrel man is... Hmm. That might be a stretch, although I would, did uh, have the good fortune of surrounding myself with a lot of good partners as rodeo clowns, first being Jim Bob, of course, and then with Rick Chapman and Leon Coffey and the Wrangler bullfights back in the 80s. And so um, we clowned in an era that was really before the microphone, before uh, rodeo clowns are, became what they are today, and that's kind of stand-up comedians. You know, we had to rely a lot on pantomime, uh, the true clown arts that, say, a Tim Conway or someone like that would practice. Oh, yeah. And I would have loved to be in a fly on the wall for those days. And, you know, I was just talking off camera with Jackie Montgomery, who's on your team here at Justin. And she mentioned where I actually told her that she was one of the OGs. So I think I'm going to put you in that category too, Tom. You're one of the OGs, the originals, the original gangsters at that matter. Um, what does it feel to, what does it mean to you? And how does it feel to be one of the originals that kind of helped um, not only you got to learn from the people before you, but then also kind of help set the stage for the rodeo clowns that are today, as you mentioned. Well, I, I you know, I fit in there somewhere, but but certainly I wouldn't class my, classify myself as an OG. I mean, my goodness, Jimmy Schumacher and Tom Lucia and, and Quail Dobbs, all those guys were, were legends before I ever even got my card back in 1974. So, you know, I had someone that I wanted to emulate. Lucia was a great hero of mine and as a barrel man and a funny man and and just his uh, actions and movements in the arena. So we emulated him a lot. Tim Conway, uh, for those that are old enough to remember, was a great star on television and just did such great things with Panama. And that's kind of what I tried to pattern my style after was the Panama uh, playing off what the announcer would say, giving him material if he needed it to come to me um, with a comment or two. And if it not, if it wasn't needed by the announcer or the flow of the rodeo, then it was just for those few in the audience that were picking it up. Oh, yeah. And I like I said before, I would have loved to see and be there as a as a member in the crowd. I'm sure there's several out there that remember you when you were a, a rodeo clown. So thank you for paving the way for the industry today. And you're so humble. You are <laughs> one of the originals in my eyes. I grew up 
um, having this have very similar rodeo role models as well. So thank you for everything you've done for the future of the sport and continue to do to live on the legacy. But one of those things that you do is the Justin Sports Medicine team and program. You help oversee the many miles that they travel down the road. And so I've just got to ask before we get into the meat of it all, what was life like and rodeo like before the Justin Sports Medicine team and and Talk to us about some of the past competitors that could have probably gone on and done better and had longer careers had they have been able to take care of their body easier. Well, I do have the good fortune of having been around before uh, sports medicine as we know it today and, of course, afterwards. So uh, and with regard to your second part of your question, you know, it, it's hard to sit back with the recent loss of, of one of the true icons of rodeo one of the most dynamic personalities ever in rodeo with the passing of larry mahan you know it's it's uh makes me very curious to wonder what his career might have been had he had the luxuries that these young cowboys have today of just in sports medicine or sports medicine in general being the king of the cowboys in the 60s and and even into the 70s he had about a 10-year span there but had he had access to sports medicine and all the technology that sports medicine brings to the athletes of today's rodeo world, there's no telling how long that career might have lasted. I couldn't agree more. And, and well said, that's so well said there. And I can't help but think about the injuries that happen that are more of an emergency injury that happened in the rodeo arena, where um, if there's if Justin Sports Medicine's not there, then they have to be rushed by ambulance. And sometimes they still do. But um, talk to us about life before that, before they were able to have that immediate help, before the ambulance was able to take them or transport them. Um, what Was it harder? Were Cowboys tougher? Well, I, I'm not going to say they were tougher, but they were tough. That's for sure. Uh, today's athlete is, is equally as tough and perhaps better conditioned uh, than some of our our pre predecessors. Um, the, the program brings more than just the medical touch and the healing process for this. It being, brings uh, training and conditioning uh, tips and ideas. It, it tells the cowboy how to prepare, how to move from, you know, everybody thought stretching was a was a, a mechanical thing that someone did for you. Now we're developing, or sports medicine has developed, you know, dynamic stretching, and it's very active, and it gets the heart rate up, and it gets the body ready for that eight seconds, you know, to 10 to 15, depending on your event, of pure adrenaline rush and physical abuse, if you will. Oh, yeah. The, the bodies of the Cowboys and the athletes out there do take a beating. They have to prepare for war almost, it feels like at times. Yeah. But um, there's probably some people out there that aren't really familiar with the program. So to kind of let everyone out there know the Justin Cow or the Justin Sports Medicine team um, has trailers. And Tom, how many trailers do they have that they're able to take to rodeos? Actually, we have three on the road currently. Uh, and before sports medicine was introduced to pro rodeo, really in 19, at the 1980 National Finals Rodeo by Dr. J. Pat Evans and an athletic trainer by the name of Don Andrews, um, cowboys were pretty much on their own. They were the tough guys. They just, they, they, they knew how to take care of themselves to do, to the degree that they were exposed to uh, information. But it wasn't like, you know, they knew how to tape properly or prepare themselves properly or do dynamic stretch and get their body ready for the competition. So that all changed in 1980 when um, <clears throat> a guy named Walt Garrison that was a running back for the Dallas Cowboys went to the team doctor, Dr. J. Pat Evans of the Dallas Cowboys, who was the orthopedic surgeon for not only the Cowboys, but the Dallas Mavericks at the time. And being a cowboy himself, Walt persuaded Dr. Evans that, you know, maybe us cowboys, us real cowboys and this kind of hat instead of helmets, need some attention, need some help. We need the same services that you're providing me when I have my shoulder pads on. 
I love how you made that connection. Helmets versus, so football players versus Cowboys. And I can't help but think back to um, a few weeks ago, actually, when I was just in your office and you showed me pictures of J. Pat Evans, you with him. Um, what's it like having been part of the conception of the Justin Sports Medicine program, seeing it, being friends with J. Pat Evans and, and knowing the impact that he's made on the industry? Well, for me, everything in life, I, I've just been so fortunate in the right place at the right time. And my career really just started to take off at the same time frame as Justin Sports Medicine was introduced. 1981 was a really a big year for me and, and one that uh, kind of launched my career, if you will. Uh, but before that, you know, I'd seen guys taping their ankles guys that were, were clowning with me, tape their ankles over their socks. Not a very uh, preventative method of preparing yourself for what you're going to encounter out in the arena. So the knowledge that they brought, the expertise, and Dr. Evans was a gruffo guy. He understood cowboys. He himself was a cowboy. And it's a certain mentality that your average run-of-the-mill physician doesn't understand that cowboy mentality or his toughness and his ability to endure pain and his pure grit to go out there and do something when he's injured, when the rest of the guys, they're sitting on the bench. Well, yeah, the heart there is is intense for sure. And same with cowboys, you know, trying to have to get up and go and protect themselves when they're enduring some of the hardest hits that they've experienced with their bodies. But one thing I want to mention too is kind of moving on to life after the sports medicine team. You talked a little bit uh, just yesterday, actually, I think about um, how Stetson Wright is now being, he's a seven time world champion and he's so young. He has so much future ahead of him because he's been able to prolong his career and prolong his body. Talk to us about the importance of the Justin sports medicine program now. And then they, they not only help the injured, but they also prevent injuries, which is the biggest and I think most important part of it. Preventing injuries is a big part of it. But if you want to use Stetson or any of his family or anybody in rodeo currently, as an example, you have to understand these guys are, are cowboys first. Before they ever got their PRCA card, before they ever got their first permit, they were riding horses properly, working cattle. They were true cowboys, and most are. Now, the focus is more on athletics and the athletic side of it today, especially in the rodeo competition. But when those guys step out of the arena, they're on the ranch. They're the cowboys. Yeah, they are. And they probably do use some of the same techniques in and out of the arena as well. And that's what I think is so encouraging about the future of rodeo. But Justin Sports Medicine team has certainly made it that way, the future brighter anyway. And um, having just been able to spend a little bit of time at Fort Worth with you in the Justin Sports Medicine room, I learned so much how serious the volunteers take their jobs and how one mistake could change somebody's life forever made on the, in, on the table there in the room. So talk to us about what the setup is like at several different rodeos and some of the things that they go to, go through to prepare and ensure that they have the best facilities, the best opportunities for all the Cowboys. Yeah, you touched on one thing, Taylor, that's really critical to the program. Uh, you have to understand that in 1981, the mobile sports medicine unit or system that Don Andrews and Dr. Evans introduced was the back of a El Camino, a brand new 1981 El Camino with a camper shell on it and a bunch of tape and bags and maybe a set of crutches or two thrown in the back. That was mobile sports medicine. It went to 11 rodeos. In today's world, we're going to approximately 125 rodeos every year something like 500 rodeo performances a year, treating 8,000 cowboys a year. And this is only possible because, as we may have mentioned earlier, we have four trailers that, or three trailers that go around the country. But those trailers aren't healing the cowboys. It's the volunteers that do. Nationwide, there's a network of some 800 uh, medical professionals. And I'm talking from heart surgeons to, you know, TCU trainers and uh, orthopedic people. 
that are volunteering their time to go out there and work on these athletes. And why? Because they know these people are special. They know how tough they are. They have an appreciation for how tough these athletes are. They won't find them sitting on the bench. Oh, saying, no. mm, I can't go in. My toe hurts. No, <laughs> not, not in rodeo. Yeah, and they their hearts are in it. They love the sport of rodeo themselves. They're rodeo fans as well as medical professionals. And that's what keeps the the Justin Sports Medicine program in line is just ran by all those volunteers. So a special shout out to all of the volunteers out there. If you are a volunteer watching this, I'd love to hear your story. Please comment, message us, whatever you want to do. But kind of talking about another program and opportunity that works alongside the Justin Sports Medicine team, but also stands alone as its own nonprofit is the Justin Cowboy Crisis Fund, one that's dear to my heart, but even dear to yours. And I've just got to ask to kind of along the same lines with the going along with the same theme of before Justin Sports Medicine, what was li- what was life like before the Justin Cowboy Crisis Fund? Well, of course, life was better because of sports medicine having been introduced back in the early 80s. But there was still a void. When a guy was hurt, you know, when he's got uh, a compound fracture of the leg that's going to take, you know, six to eight months to heal or he's had to have rotator cuff surgery and he's not going to be able to rope a calf or or team rope uh, for another six months to a year. There's a void. These guys didn't have any way to make a living. You know, they were getting in, in financial trouble and stuff. So once again, you know, through the connection of John Justin Jr. and his love for the sport and his love for the people in the sport and his dedication to giving back to those people who bought his product. The idea was presented to the PRCA for a crisis fund. And as luck would have it, again, timing was just right. I happened to have stepped out of the arena and into uh, the world of professional rodeo at their national headquarters. And that was one of my earliest assignments was taking this idea that Justin has brought to us and developing it to develop a crisis fund to help these cowboys out. Now, we don't pay their medical bills, but we do help with their cost of living. So when a guy is hurt and he's out for six months, it's a traumatic injury. He doesn't have to worry about the rent being paid, the child support, or the family going hungry, or any of those things. If it's qualified, the crisis fund steps in and pays their cost of living expenses and there's no return. There's nothing asked in return. It's just something that through the benevolence of people that love rodeo and make donations to the crisis fund, uh, these guys can now survive without losing, you know, their home or without running of risk of marital problems because there's not enough money to pay the bills. You know, it goes a little deeper than just on the surface. And it's, the most unique thing about the crisis fund and the thing all us, all of us that are involved with it, with the most unique thing all of us uh, cherish about the crisis fund is that 100% of all the donations people make to the crisis fund go directly to help these rodeo athletes, male, female, uh, professional, non-professional, help recover and take care of their bills while they're recovering. 100% of all those donations go that way. And that's only possible because the Justin Boot Company and the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association underwrite all the expenses of operating the fund. Wow. I am left speechless. I I know that was something I knew, but even just hearing it again from your mouth, it kind of humbles a person and, and puts it into perspective that, there are good guys out there and the cowboy way of life is going to continue to live on because cowboys can afford to still be cowboys. And that's something that's so admirable. And uh, one thing that I think a lot of people need to know too, is the board members that ha- give their time. They, they sit in on meetings occasionally, they attend the fundraisers and they spend their own personal time, money, resources, all of this Um, investing in going through all the applications that are sent in front of their desk to confirm, approve, deny, you know, do their research on all the different cases. And so 
I don't know if if you want to or not, but let's talk to a, li- a little bit about the um, amount of notable people that are on the board that have served their time on the board, um, that have given their their time and dedication, and their, that's their own personal time to help make the Justin Cowboy Crisis Fund what it is. As I recall, the, the original board was six members. Now we're up to 13. But Dr. J. Pat Evans and Don Andrews, who we've already talked about with sports medicine, they were original board members. A man that's uh, being inducted into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame this year as well. Brian McDonald was the bull riding director for years and years and years. He was an original director and is still a director. So we have the longevity of these guys. And along the way, such personalities as Charlie Daniels, the great Nolan Ryan, Walt Garrison, who impacted the sports medicine program, as well as the crisis fund, have all been members. And of course, we have uh, rodeo committees represented and the medical community is well represented because I don't recognize some of those terms. So I can't make a, a good evaluation. I can uh, most likely know the Cowboys and their situation and between what the medical part or members of our board bring to the table and what myself and Brian and others bring to the table, we can come up with the best solution for these guys. And we have rodeo committees on involved because rodeo committees are one of our biggest fundraisers there are. They individually, whether it's taking a tip jar from their bar at their rodeo and making a donation to the crisis fund or having elaborate uh, golf tournaments like San Antonio Rodeo does and and um, the St. Paul, Oregon Rodeo that's going into the hall this, this year as well. You know, they all make contributions to the fund and that's what makes it happen. Oh, yes. And we absolutely have to mention a few more people. Patrick Gotch at the Cowboy Channel, Pam Minnick, Jimmy Monroe. These legends will live forever and go down in history as being kind as well. And I think it's really neat. I got to be a part of the fundraisers when I was traveling the rodeo road and there was fashion shows, barbecues, fish fries, anything, you name it. So you heard it right there. It's it's so easy to have an event and raise money for the Justin Cowboy Crisis Fund. If you're interested and curious and you want to be able to um, just donate your own fund, you're more than able and willing to. You can go to justincowboycrisisfund.org and give there. It's very simple. You can do it online or through the phone, whatever you need to do. And um, I think this is a great opportunity to give back to a community that has given so much to you. If you're listening from the Western industry, or if you're just a fan of rodeo, know that your money will go to such a great cause. I think that's so, so important. So Tom, thank you for telling the story there. That's um, so iconic. Another another way to contribute, uh, Taylor, is one of my favorites is to memorialize a loved one or a friend or somebody in the sport uh, that has passed. I'll send them a check in their memory. And, you know, there's nothing better for that person that's passed to know, you know, it's such an honor to for them to have the knowledge or their family to have the knowledge that they are continuing to help the people in the Western industry and the Western lifestyle that we all cherish so very, very much. You're exactly right. What a fun way to be able to honor your friends, um, loved ones, all of that. That's I, I'm so sad that I left that off. Thank you for bringing that up, Tom. That's something that I admire about you, that you do personally. So thank you for that as well. And that just goes to show the board members that are involved, um, everyone that's involved with the, both the sport, Justin Sports Medicine team and the Justin Cowboy Crisis Fund have a, a personal interest as well. Their, their hearts are so big. And so I think that's what keeps, keeps it all going too. But before we go, I know we're, we're about to run out of time. Tom, I want to talk with you a little bit more and pick your brain. The, the history buffs out there are going to love this. And even if you're not into history, you're going to love these stories that are about to be told too. Tom, what was your life like um, through your career here at Justin? I know you were one of the very few that are still around that was fortunate enough to work with John S. Justin Jr. and go into his office and see the desk that he sits at that we still have today and um, preserve his memory. So what was what was it like, the evolution of Justin in your perspective? Well, you know, there's been a common theme throughout this conversation that we're having, and that's one word, and it's Justin. And 
back when the company was started in 1879 and then by H.J. Justin, who was John Justin's grandfather, uh, towards the end of his life, he left a, a, a statement, a mission statement for his company that has always resonated so much to me and my travels through the world of Justin. And H.J. Justin said, I wish to leave behind me an institution that will uphold the standards and spirit of the true West. And that's such a powerful statement because that's truly what the Justins have done throughout the history of the company, continue to do now that there's not a Justin involved directly with the company. But that legacy lives on, and certainly these programs um, are the epitome of protecting, upholding the standards and spirit of the true West. Wow, they really are. And what a cool foundation to have. I mean, even through the generations of Justin's. And then even now, they've instilled that in you, just, you know, an employee of theirs. So not even a family member, someone who grew to become like family, I would say, just because you um, have the love and the passion for the family and and everything that they stood for. What do you remember in the day to day? Was there any fun m moments or memories that you got to experience? Oh, yeah. I mean, to to sit at the table with John and Jane Justin was such an honor and have a meal or, or visit or go to their home and visit. Uh, but, you know, their memory is not something that's just pushed aside now that, uh, you know, we're a Berkshire Hathaway company and, you know, things are different, if you will. They're not so different. You know, and John and Jane Justin still impact not only rodeo, but the Fort Worth community and the world worldwide. So there's a foundation, the John and Jane Justin Foundation, that is so very active in benevolent uh, gifts, grants, if you will, to places like TCU, to building a Jane and John Justin um, surgical tower right here about a mile from our location that give regularly uh, to support Cook's Children's Hospital and all just it's it's unreal. The millions and millions and millions of dollars that Justin and the foundation have put back into not only Fort Worth, but to the betterment of the world. The neurosurgical uh, research that has happened with uh, Cook's Children's Hospital, you know, that the foundation have made donations to. It's just, it's just incredible the leg legacy that has lived through the Justin name. It's not just a logo, it's a spirit. So you mentioned before in your response that you got to sit at the same table as the Justins and John and Jane Justin. And I heard that Jane Justin was an incredible cook. I've seen her cookbook. I've tried to follow some of her recipes. Did you ever get to enjoy a home-cooked meal? I, I won't say that I did. But I did get to dine with them. And you talk about the most elegant lady you've ever seen. I mean, it's just su such a wonderful story. And Mr. Justin surrounding himself. I mean, he spent 20 plus years as chairman of the board of the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo. He could tell you everybody that was a volunteer, their names and what they did to help the stock show and rodeo. So the Justin blueprint, if you will, is all over the city of Fort Worth. It's all over the state of Texas and it's all over the world. It really is. And being an Oki, becoming a Texas transplant, that was one of the coolest things I latched onto was um, they, it didn't matter how much money they had or who they were or their involvement and in what elite <laughs> causes. Um, from what I've learned and the, the history that I've seen written, they loved so big and they gave back wherever they could and to be even it's 2023 and to have them 
still being talked about and their legacy living on, I I feel is incredible. And me personally, as a woman, I love going through our archives and seeing all of Jane Justin's clothing. You said um, that she was a phenomenal woman and I agree. She's, she's very elegant. And um, so I think it's so cool that you got to have, you got to be a part of that in your work life when you were kind of just starting out too. Do you, do you remember your first memory of meeting Mr. Justin? Um, You know, I would see the Justins at, at rodeos or around and long before i quit clowning i was i would help at the national finals rodeo with the sponsor relationship and so you know i might see mr justin once a year and he would remember me call me my name and that was the, the most phenomenal thing to me that you know somebody of his stature in the community could remember my name you know and and i wasn't connected to his company in any way nor did i have even the slightest premonition that i ever would be but the the justins and what they represent were just always so very genuine make no mistake about it the man wanted to make money and wanted to make the best boots there were and sell boots but he was so so generous as was she uh with what they had and paying it back to the uh paying it forward if you will and i think it's really neat for me to see the the love and the spirit that that they've left in you that you continue on in the day to day i mean any of our meetings you're you're always the one that we go to to make sure everything is on brand with what the 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 justin brand stands for and so i can't help but ask you where do you see the future of justin going well, we're very fortunate in, in that uh, as being part of, of Shoe Holdings, uh, which is a much, much bigger component to footwear inside the Berkshire Hathaway family. We're very fortunate that those people understand, respect, and admire the history, not only of Justin, but my goodness, Tony Lama as well. The stories of Tony Lama and his the boot company that he founded and the stories of Miss Enid Justin, who was the daughter of H.J. Justin, who went on when her brothers moved the, the uh, Justin boot company to Fort Worth in 1925. She said, no, I don't think my daddy would have wanted it that way. She stayed in Okona, Texas, 1925, depression, and a lady starts her own company and makes a splash and is still around today. Yeah, that's just so incredible to hear the history and to think back that you're exactly right. A woman in 1925 started her own company. That That is so inspiring. And it does provide hope for um, the Western industry as a whole, but then also the bootmaking community. Um, I, I truly feel that the future is bright. And I want to say thank you for taking the time to talk with us today about it all, Tom. You have um, been a 